A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Let me also say good morning and welcome to Community Christian. My name's Jason, and I'm one of the pastors here. And as some of you already know, uh, I am also a father to two amazing daughters. And one thing that all parents kind of know is that each one of your children are, are unique and they're special in their own way. They each have their own talents, they have their own gifts, their tendencies, and they all show up in the world in their own particular way. And as a parent, no matter what, uh, you wind up loving each and every one of those little differences, each and every one of those things. Even if one of those things drives you crazy, you still love it. Um, I have uh, one of my daughters, uh, when she was just barely old enough to read and write, she developed a gift, a passion, you might call it, for just she loved to write stories. That was like her thing. And so many of you who are um, raising little kids already know this, but when you have one day of the week where you can like sleep and not be a parent, it's like gold to you, right? And um, Saturday morning uh, for our lives had sort of become that, that thing, you know. The Saturday morning was when I knew my, me and my wife were going to get to sleep in, but I had this little one at the time, she's my oldest, so we just had one kid at the time. She liked to get up early still, and so we had. she was old enough to kind of take care of herself at that point, so we had this little talk. He's like, look, Mom and Dad really need to sleep, you know? So can you just, like, play in your room or just go find something that you like to do and just try and be really quiet and let Mom and Dad sleep? And, and she was good. She did that. But what she came up with was writing stories. In fact, when I would wake up on Saturday mornings, most Saturday mornings I would come and I would find her in our office, and she would have paper stacked all over the desk. Some of it was bound and some of it was folded and decorated and had writings and illustrations all over that all over them and she would present to me these wildly imaginative stories that she had come up with and they were so fascinating sometimes her mom and I would be in the story sometimes her little sister might show up in the story as she grew up and many of the times in fact I would say most of the time the cat was in the story because she was obsessed with our cat at the time but out of all the characters the one that showed up most often in her stories and you can probably already guess this was very simple it was her <laughs> She was in almost all of her stories because in my little girl's imagination, she would start creating these, this little world and these adventures that she would have with people and pets that she loved. And sometimes she'd have a problem that we would overcome or sometimes there'd be a mystery that had to be solved. Sometimes there were places that she would go or places that we had just been and she would write about. Some of them were silly, some of them were fun, but almost every one of them, <laughs> she would be the central part of the story. Now that's sweet and that's cute when you're six. Not so sweet, not so cute when you're 26 
or 36 or 66. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's been my experience within my own life and within the lives of the people that I've gotten to know over the years. Most of us spend a lot of time in our lives building a life or, for our purposes, writing a story that has me as the central character. But the older you get and the more you mature, the more you come to realize that you don't get to write most of your story. In fact, most of your story just gets handed to you. Or it's just stuff that just happens to you, right? And here's what I mean. You didn't write all those parts of your story where everything went wrong and the story got difficult. You didn't get to write that part, did you? See, you didn't write the part where you got served divorce papers. You didn't write the part where you wound up raising a kid all by yourself. Or you didn't write the part where you lost your job and you couldn't find work. Or the part where your child has ADHD or autism. You didn't write the part of your story where you have to take care of a parent or a spouse with dementia. You didn't write the part of the story where you or someone that you love is now faced with an addiction. And it's just been my experience that Eventually, you get to the point where writing a story with me at the center, with you at the center, it just doesn't work out all that great. In fact, most of that experience is exhausting and it's frustrating because your story just keeps getting away from you, doesn't it? Your story never turns out like you want it to. And I never quite wind up being the hero of the story that I wanted to be happily ever after. Mm. Just doesn't work out all the time. So what we've decided to explore for the last few weeks as a church community is that there is an alternative way for you to write your story. In fact, it's really about you and me giving up completely on this idea of writing my story with me at the center. <laughs> it's just abandoning that pursuit because the life we find described in the pages of the Bible which is the story that God is telling about the human race, is more so about you and me resting in the freedom that comes when we stop trying to center ourselves in the story and instead we join the story God is already telling. And the story is this. God entered the world as the man Jesus Christ. And through that one man, he showed us the true nature of God and the true nature of a human being. See, in Jesus, we see God for who he is, but we also see ourselves for who we were meant to be. Jesus had one message. He said, life in that story, life in the story that God is writing, has become available to you, anybody, right now. And then he said, I am the way to that life. And anybody who wants in on this life, will you get invited in? But the story, he would say, is found right here. It is centered around me and the story that God's telling is a really incredible life where you and I get to live interactively with the author of life the central figure in the story and the cool thing is is when we start to live like this when we fully give ourselves to that kind of life when we truly participate in that story that's when the story finally makes sense that's when it all kind of comes together when the pieces finally fit and and really, the freedom starts. So, around here every week, for the past few weeks, when we gather as a church community, we're trying to center our, our attention around the life of Jesus, particularly around the stories that were told by the people who were with Jesus. And we're particularly focusing on how did Jesus choose to interact with people? How did he live interactively with the people that he met, with the people that he came in contact with? Because what we see in these stories of interaction with Jesus is, again, we first see the nature of God. We, we see clearly who God is. And we see the story that God is telling. But we also see that this is an invitation. It's, it's an invitation to you. It's an invitation to me to come and join God in this interactive kind of life. So today, Jesus' story begins with Jesus and his disciples having just finished a pretty eventful five-mile boat trip where a storm nearly shipwrecked them. And even though Jesus had calmed the storm miraculously and they reached the shore safely, it was late. They were tired and emotionally spent from sailing all evening from what they had just witnessed. 
not to mention scared and confused because of where they were. They were moving from their Jewish homeland into Gentile country, a region known as the Gerasenes. So imagine being one of these disciples. You're exhausted. You just want to find a place and get a shower and some sleep. You're confused at what you just saw. You're in an unfamiliar place with unfamiliar people that you honestly don't really like in a culture that you don't understand very well. And through the darkness, you see someone running towards you, screaming like a madman. As he gets closer to you, you see he's not wearing clothes. He's got shackles around his feet and ankles with broken chains on them, and he's bleeding from cuts all over his body. You might be thinking, I don't remember signing up for this. I'm just gonna go home now. Let's be honest, this is a really weird story. It sounds like something out of a horror movie, and for most of us, we don't know what to make of it. Demonic possession? Is this for real? And the questions and doubts you have around it may make you want to dismiss it, but don't rush too quickly to judge. Because just remember, the invitation of Jesus is for us to participate in the story that he is telling. And that story didn't end 2,000 years ago, so this has implications for us today, even if we don't know what to do with it yet. You see, in our modern culture, we deal with the topic of demon possession like we do most things we're afraid of or we don't understand. We just either ignore it and consider it something that less educated, less enlightened people believe in. It's something that we've progressed past in our modern, sophisticated world. Or we turn it into a caricature, a source of entertainment. It's the plot device for a great horror movie. But here's what Jesus himself and the church after him have agreed on for thousands of years. The powers of darkness and evil are alive and active in our world. There's an enemy of God and God's purposes. And he is called many different names in the Bible, Satan, the devil, but he is not a cartoon Halloween character. And depending on the time and the culture and whatever he finds most effective for the day and time, we see him show up in all kinds of ways. But mostly what we see are the effects these powers have on our world, particularly on people. And you can boil it down to this. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy the people God loves and the world he's created. So when Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, steps onto the pages of history, he has one mission. Jesus came to conquer the powers of evil and to establish the kingdom of God. In other words, to undo the work of the enemy and to set all things right according to the will and nature of God. Which, by the way, the nature of God is all-consuming, other-centered, enemy-embracing, self-sacrificial love. But here's the deal, and this is what we see every time Jesus confronts the powers of darkness and evil. Bringing in another kingdom where one already exists doesn't happen without some resistance. It's not like colonizing Mars. If you want to take over Mars, all you have to do is get there and plant a flag in the ground. There's no one there to resist. There's no kingdom to replace. But when there is another force or kingdom in place, they're going to resist. And that opposing force has one mission, to divide and destroy what the new kingdom is setting in place. And that's what you see over and over again in the ministry of Jesus through these encounters with demons and demon possession. And we still see it today in cultures all over the world. But mostly in our culture, the resistance comes in much more subtle ways because honestly, it's way more effective. The enemy is very content to have us keep his presence in the realm of Halloween costumes and horror movies for laughs or cheap scares. He is satisfied with the subtle, unnoticed work he is doing, destroying lives and families and the planet and everything and everyone else God loves. So for the purposes of what I'd like to do today, instead of us getting into all the details of Satan, demons, and possession, what if we simply looked at what evil looks like and what it does so that we would be able to recognize it when we see it? And the reason this is so important, if you're a follower of Jesus, is that we need to be aware of the places where the enemy is right now disrupting the kingdom of God among us. See, we are the ambassadors of the king, right? Church, we are the ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are here to continue Jesus' work of bringing his kingdom on earth as it is 
in heaven, right? Okay. And we've been given the power to do this in Jesus' name. So as we look at this terrifying man running toward Jesus and his disciples, I want you to think about this question. What do we see? What has the enemy done to this man? Well, the first thing we see is he's living out his life in isolation from other people. He went out into a desolate place. He's been cast out of society, pushed away from family, friends, the people who love him. We also see that he lives, did you notice, in a literal graveyard out among the tombs. He's literally identified himself with death. He makes his home surrounded by death. For all practical purposes, well, he might as well be dead. And then Jesus sees him. And what is the first thing Jesus does? <laughs> he asks him his name. What an odd thing. I think it's a way for Jesus, I think this act was him humanizing this guy for maybe the first time in a really long time, identifying him as a true member of society, someone worthy of dignity and respect and love. But did you notice the man doesn't even answer for himself? The demons answer for him? What does that tell us? It tells us that his identity has become so buried underneath his problems. He identifies more with his problems than he even does with his own name. He feels at, more at home with the evil inside of him than who he really is. He's become a man full of voices taking up nearly every space in his own head. Voices or thoughts that tell him who he is, who he's not anymore. Voices that drive him away from connection, away from community, to the point where he's no longer living in the reality of what we know is true about him. He lives in the reality of simply what is going on inside of his own mind. His name is taken away from him. He's no longer that boy who wore that name proudly that his mom and dad gave him when he was a kid. His problems, his issues, the voices, the thoughts in his mind have literally become his identity. Let me ask you this. You know somebody like this? Have you become someone like this? Or let's back up. You ever have days like that? <laughs> Just days, right? Days when the one thing consumes everything. You know what I'm talking about? When all you can see, all you can feel is the fear, the anxiety, the pain, the trauma, the addiction, the dread, and that's all there is. All you can hear is just those thoughts inside of your head, and honestly, they sound a whole lot more like defeat than anything else. Voices that sound like death more than they sound like life. Thoughts that lead you to isolate, to pretend Everything's okay, don't you talk about it, because who's going to love you if they know, and who's going to understand? See, the labels we put on the work of our enemy inside of us is a lot less important than what it is doing to us. Remember, evil takes what God created, what God intended. He steals, he distorts it, he tears it up, and he burns it down. And I'll tell you this, the battleground where I believe this is all being fought in our day, in our time, in our culture, is your mind and your emotions. Many people want to call it our mental health crisis. That's fine. Call it what you want. We've got record levels of anxiety and depression and trauma and self-harming thoughts and self-harming behaviors. I don't care nearly as much about what you call it as I care about what it does to people. And it's going on in our world right now. And can I also say this? I believe it's going on in this room right now. And the first step in doing something about this is we've got to recognize it. And the church needs to be a safe place where we can talk about it. Because I'm telling you, the enemy is using mental illness. He's using emotional distress in our day to destroy the work of God and the spreading of his kingdom. And Jesus cares about your emotional health. Jesus cares about your mental health. How do I know that? I know it because of this story. And I know it because of dozens of other stories that we have recorded for us in the scriptures. And we need to have the same compassion for ourselves and for one another that Jesus has for this demon-possessed man. 
See, I've just come to understand from working with people and honestly from my own experiences, almost no one gets taken down the road that we see here, the road that the enemy leads us down because they intended for it to be that way or they intended for it to happen. And I don't think anybody intends to go there. I want you to think about this man. Let's just use him for an example, okay? And we'll use it for our own selves. You cannot tell me that this, this man in the story woke up one day and just all of a sudden, out of the blue, made a decision. You know what? I think I'm going to go ostracize myself from community. I think I'm going to go down and live by the cemetery. And I think I want to just live down there, cut myself with rocks. I don't think that happened. I don't even think he ever really had that thought, those thoughts at all. I think they started out with just these, these tiny little thoughts. And really what they were was just these tiny little lies that the enemy whispered into his brain. And over time, he gradually, one by one, started to believe it because that was the only voice that was speaking into his life. They started out as thoughts of fear, thoughts of paranoia, thoughts of self-hatred, thoughts of depression, thoughts of hopelessness. And that's how the enemy starts. And that's how he winds up deceiving all of us. These voices inside your head, these thoughts that come to you, that you wind up listening to, they don't start out sounding evil. They don't sound distorted. They don't sound destructive. You know what they sound like? They sound true. They sound true. They feel normal. Like, well, this is the way things are. All I'm doing is I'm just seeing the world for how it is or what it is. And what it is is I'm a failure. I'm disgusting. I'm unattractive. I don't have any skills. Things aren't going to get any better. God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me. And if God doesn't love me, then how could anybody else? And they keep going and going and going, and they spiral down further and further and further, and they get louder and louder, and then you get more and more isolated because you can't talk to anybody about this because well, who would understand? And if you don't talk to anybody else, here's what happens. You don't ever hear any other perspective besides the one in your head. And what feels like reality to you, in reality, is just a conversation that you and the enemy are having in your head. And then pretty soon, everybody else in your life looks at your, you and your life, and they see everything that's going on. They see reality for what it is. Everybody knows it. Everybody can see it, except for you, because you're isolated. They see you're in trouble, but you think it's just the way it is. It's just reality. Dr. Daniel Amen, he is the world's greatest expert on brain health today going. I mean, he's got an amazing, uh, amazing resources online. You should look him up. But he says one of the best treatments for depression he says, the first step is you simply need to stop believing everything you think. He says, just test every thought you have. Just don't trust those thoughts. Share every thought you have with another person. Talk it out. And before you believe that thought, you doubt it first. Just doubt it. Which is really interesting to me, that advice. Because if you're a Bible person, it ought to sound real familiar to you. That advice sounds a whole lot like what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10 when he said we should take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Doubt your thoughts. Test them. Don't believe everything that comes into your head. And see, that kind of evil, that kind of thinking, which leads you to destructive thoughts and destructive emotions, it almost always will come to you at a time when you are the most vulnerable It'll be a time when you are hurt, when you've been, your life has been disrupted, when there's been some pain or some grief. And again, this is not intentional. It's not your fault. Nobody starts out on this road. They just wind up there gradually. But I'll tell you, it almost always starts as a result of a tragedy, a trauma, a wound, or some grief. But can I share some good news with you? And listen, because this is the interactive story that you are being invited into. Jesus invites you into this interaction right here. Whenever Jesus encountered the powers of darkness and evil that had invaded people's minds and their bodies, do you know what we see? We see something very clearly. 
Evil is outmatched with Jesus every single time. Not any exceptions. In fact, if you, if you read these stories, it's not even a battle. It's not even a conflict. The deceptive demonic voices, when they are in the presence of the Son of God, they tremble. They're afraid. They beg him for mercy. Why is that? Well, it's because simply they're in the presence of truth. They're in the presence of truth embodied in a person. And the only thing that the enemy has are lies. That's why they flee into a herd of pigs, right? Jesus is stronger than any demonic power or any thought that the forces of evil may present you with. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 11. He said, but if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then you should know that the kingdom of God has now arrived among you. And then he uses an illustration. He says, see, when a strong man is fully armed and he guards his palace, his possessions are safe until... Someone even stronger attacks and they overpower him. They strip him of his weapons and they carry off his belongings. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about him. Jesus is that strong man. The enemy and all of his schemes and all of his lies, they've set up shop somewhere and they're protecting their own. And then the strong man shows up and the enemy flees. Jesus can overcome any lie, any scheme that the devil ever came up with. And so here's what I want us to do before we go any further. I want us to just stop. We're going to pause. And I want us to take a moment right now. And we need to ask for the help of our strong man, our mighty God. If you are plagued with deceptive thoughts, if you are struggling with your mental health, we need to cry out to him first. So Becky's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. We often live unaware of the lies that we are accepting as truth, often because they come from a very real place of hurt or grief or trauma. Those experiences are real and they have to be acknowledged and worked through, but they are not the only truth in our lives. It is also true that God is with you and that he loves you. He's on your side and he wants to make that power and presence available to you. He wants to heal us and set us free in the truth of his love. So, what lies are you accepting as truth? What are the lies that are wrecking your relationships, your decisions, or even your mental health? What lies have led you away from from life with God. Let's take a moment and ask God to speak to each of us and reveal what lies we're believing. If you're not sure you believe all that we do, I mean, I totally get the idea of listening to God may even sound bizarre. And I just want to say, it's not like we're trying to hear just an audible voice or trying to manufacture some kind of mystical experience, but... We do believe that interactive life with God is a life of speaking to God and listening to him speak to us. So would you just be open to that? Let's take a moment now to ask God to reveal what lies are we believing. While your heads are still bowed, I would love to pray for the power of Jesus to set us free from the lies that we accept as truth. If there's a lie or a struggle with your mental health that you'd like Jesus to set you free from, um, would you take a moment and raise your hand? There's nothing magical in doing it. We, we don't know always how God will answer our prayers, but he has invited us to bring our hurts and concerns for him and to do this for one another 
So would you take a moment, raise your hand, and just let me know? Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know you are here with us, and we know that you love us and that you are on our side. So I just ask on behalf of my brothers and sisters that your power and presence would be at work in our lives. Would you please set us free from the lies of our enemy? Heal our hearts and our minds so that we can live fully in your love and empower us to do what we cannot do on our own, to live in the freedom of your love. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we do believe that Jesus has all power. He has all authority over the lies and the schemes of the devil. And there's some good news about that. He has given us the power to resist the enemy. And so to wrap this up, I wanted to talk a little more about how we can do that. How do we resist the enemy who is stealing and killing and destroying the kingdom of God among us? Well, I'll give you five things. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we have to recognize it. We've got to know the signs when we see them. See, the evil, like many people are facing today with mental illness, emotional distress, and like the man in the story today, if you listen to that voice long enough, it destroys relationships, it will isolate people, it whispers despair, it's hopeless, it's never going to get any better. And then that voice will bind you to destructive patterns. It tells you, just keep doing these things that you're doing over and over and over. And down deep, down deep, you know it's causing you harm. And it's reducing you and the people around you down to this, just this one central thing. And usually what that one thing is the smallest, weakest thing about you. And what it's doing is it's speaking the opposite of what God has said. But if we'll just commit to becoming wise to the lies of our enemy... We'll start to spot them when we see them, and it won't have a chance to take the root that it often does. The second thing is we have to arm ourselves in advance long before they come. And the way we do that is we, like what we just did. We start by asking our Father, who has all the power we need, to share that power with us, to, to be within us, to help empower us to do it. But you have to ask for it. I mean... I say this to clients all the time, but God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. You've got to ask him for his help. And we have to seek it. Remember when Jesus' disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we've been watching you pray. We've been hearing how you do it. We're no good at it. Can you teach us how to pray? <laughs> and then Jesus launched into what we call the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer, right? I would say that if Jesus gives us a model for how to pray, it probably means that it's one of the things we ought to be praying most often. <laughs> and one of the things that Jesus put in his model prayer, if you remember, is he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Right? Deliver us from evil. On the night before his death, Jesus pulled his disciples together and he said, hey, guys, we're going to go pray. And he told them specifically what to pray for. He said, I want you to pray for the strength that you will not fall into temptation. What temptation? Well, for them, it was the temptation to forget the truth and to fall for a lie. Because what was about to happen to Jesus would lead them to believe all hope is lost and death has won. And Jesus knew if they were not prepared for that moment, if they were not drawing strength from the source of all strength, evil would overtake them and those lies would gain ground. So we have to do the same. We have to prepare ourselves and we have to pray so that we would not be deceived by our enemy who's lying to us. And then number three, we claim our true identity. See, when the evil one is feeding you with those lies, especially when he's talking to you about who he says you are, you have to combat that lie with the truth. And the truth is what God has already said about you that you know to be true. For example, 
and, and I'll admit before I give you this illustration, I came to the party late on this one, but I have recently discovered the show on Apple TV called Ted Lasso. I love that show. Anyway, um, but on this show, if you haven't seen it, um, on Ted Lasso, there is a character. His name is Colin, okay? And Colin in the show goes to a therapist. And in therapy, he realizes that he's struggling with negativity, struggling with negative thoughts about himself. And so Colin's therapist helps him create a mantra, okay? And so whenever he messes up, whenever somebody insults Colin or they try to bring him down, Colin has a mantra, and he just repeats it over and over out loud to himself. And Colin's mantra is this, I am a strong and capable man. I am a strong and capable man. What he's doing in that moment is he's reminding himself of what he already knows is true when he's faced with the lies that people tell him. Brothers and sisters, you have a mantra. You're just not using it. You're not living in it, and it is your true identity, and it comes straight from the one who made you. He's the one who knows. So what is your mantra? What is our true identity? We are the sons and the daughters of a king, not just a king, but the king, the king of kings. We are dearly loved children. We are heirs to the kingdom of God. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That is who we are. So don't, don't you dare believe everything you think. You believe what God thinks. Number four, we have to call evil out by its name. See, darkness loses all power whenever it gets exposed to the light. In fact, I don't want to go too heavy into this, but this is just true. Darkness doesn't even exist. Darkness is not a real thing. You realize that, right? All darkness is is the absence of light. It just means light isn't there yet. Darkness is not a thing in and of itself. So whenever it's dark and you can't see, you, all you got to do is just bring light and you realize, oh, there is no darkness. <laughs> it just kind of goes away. So for those of us if you're a survivor of mental illness or addiction, remember that time, it, it, some of you know this, remember that time when you said it out loud for the first time? When you said the words, hi, I, I'm so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic. Or you said the words for the first time, I, I'm an addict, or I have PTSD. You remember the freedom that came when you told someone for the first time, hey, I'm depressed, I have panic attacks. I was abused. I was neglected. Remember the, just the freedom that came when you said it out loud. You know why that's so? Because your enemy loves nothing more than when we hide our pain and we keep our struggles in the dark. And when we call his evil out by its name, we bring light to it and it just flees. It starts to shrink. Now, maybe not all at once. I get that. But it loses power when darkness is exposed to light. So we have to call it out. We have to say it. And that leads me to our final thing. we got to call in reinforcements. And what that means is you need some help. You've got to ask for help. See, we are the most vulnerable when we are by ourselves. Those evil thoughts, those patterns, those negative emotions... You have to get them out of your head and into the ears of someone who cares for you, someone who will listen to you, and then redirect you to again hear the voice of God. God speaks best through the loving voice of his children. So we are better when we are talking and we are listening and we are supporting each other. See, here's the cool thing about being a follower of Jesus. One thing we understand very clearly about this fight we are not fighting against people. So if we're not fighting against people, that means we are not fighting one another. We are not blaming one another. We are fighting evil forces who are tormenting people who are trying to, that are trying to destroy them. So again, we don't fight each other. We fight for each other. 
That's what we do. And if you are choosing to fight your battle alone, you are missing out on one of the greatest sources of strength that you could ever have. Your brothers and your sisters. Someone else who can help you and redirect you to the, vo- to the voice of God. You were not meant to fight alone. That's why you lose when you're alone. So can I just say for some of you today, that may be your number one thing. You're just alone. You, you, need a, you, need a, you, need a, you need some people. You need a community. You, you need to come into, you need to step into it right now. Because honestly, you're fighting your battle alone. You need someone who will just simply hold space for your story. And for you, maybe that would be enough. And if that's you, the best way I know to do that around here is you just take your next step. Sign up for next steps on the card, talk to somebody, and just be a part of that experience, and you will find some people, and we'll walk you through that whole process. But others of you, it is time. You need the help of a professional counselor. And you've been resisting it for a long, long time. And I'm so happy to tell you that we are a church that believes in mental health care and counseling and therapy whenever it is needed. That's why within the next month or two, give or take, we're working. We are going to be launching Community Christian Counseling, a professionally run, low-cost counseling center right here in our space. And if you're wondering about if this is right for me and you're just not sure, that's okay. But there's a place on that card today in your seat that says, hey, I'm just, I'm interested. I want to know more. And if you check that box, uh, we'll reach out to you um, and we'll help you. And if you want to talk to me on your way out the door, I'll be standing at the Next Step Center. I would be honored to hold space for you. Whatever step God is leading you to take, I just want to give you a minute of silence to just pray and reflect on whatever it is. And after we have our time of silence, our band's going to come. They're going to lead us in worshiping the God who sets us free from the power of evil.